Uh, my name is Rhea. I use she, they pronouns. And um, yeah, I'm calling from Oakland, California. And it's just a pleasure to be with you. So welcome, folks. Um, thank you for choosing to spend your Saturday morning or afternoon, uh, depending where you are right now with us. We ask you all to be present and grounded here together in this virtual space. And if you don't have your camera on, but you feel you're in a place where you could have your camera on, I invite you to do that, to turn your camera on. I'd love to see your face. Um, makes it feel like we're all together. So we appreciate your time and to maximize our time together, we have requested that you do what's best for you um, to be here and to really center yourself uh, during this call. So use your bathroom, go get some water, take good care. Uh, we wanna begin with our land acknowledgement. It's critical to be familiar with the indigenous land that you are on. Um, I, like I said, I'm calling from Oakland. So I'm currently um, on the unceded land of the Chochenyo Oleni, Ohlone people. Um, who have lived on this land for thousands of years and have survived resiliently the colonization by the Spanish, um, the violence by the Mexican rancheros and the white gold rushers. So if you are unfamiliar with whose land you are on, after this call, I want to encourage you to look it up. And you can use this cool little tool that I will put in the chat to do that. All right. So, um, we know people are attending today's call from a lot of different places today, both physically and mentally. And in terms of what you are bringing to this space, I want to let you know that it is all invited. No matter who you are, um, we want to welcome you. So, I am a proud member of the League for Revolution, the League of Revolutionaries for a New America, which is organizing this ho this call. Um, and I am a member because Lerna believes that we need a revolution. Lerna believes that we as a people can come together and collectively think to build the strategies that we need to abolish the police, to create the world that we know we deserve. So we understand that we are in a critical moment in this history of our civilization. And to better understand the political moment of today, made ripe by the inequality within our system, exposed by this pandemic, by this racial pandemic, we can look to history. We can look to our movement's history to ease us and to guide us. When we look at the conclusion of the civil war, History was presented with the opportunity to, or the country was presented with the opportunity to reorganize the society around the interests of the newly freed people. But we know that the overthrow of reconstruction ensured that that did not happen. Slavery was replaced by wage slavery. And now today, laborers grow closer and closer to a future where robots are coming to take our job. And we know that this technological advancement happening next to us Will, will soon result in a new economic change. So what do we do? Well, as we look to the future and we can you know, see this, this new economic change coming, we can be rest assured that if we are organized, that if we are stand united in our demands, we can live in a world of, where everyone lives in abundance with our basic needs met without exploitation. So today, we need an abolitionist movement that will continue to aim at the heart of capitalism by exposing the hypocrisies of the institutions created to protect it. Revolutionaries, all of you here, must tell our people the truth about policing and tell, the history, and tell their history, expose the history of them being slave patrols at their very inception created to protect property and subjugate black people, not protect the people. So defunding the police to refund our community is now a national conversation. And the uprisings last summer were the biggest in United States history. And today we are still mourning and we are still honoring George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Sean Monterosa, Alan Bluford, and the countless others who have lost their lives to the terror of policing. And we will never forget. We are living in the end stages of capitalism and the ruling class knows this. So we will not be fooled by the militarized police. We know that this state is weak and they know and they can see us building this power. And so the political direction and the reconstruction of society is not assured. It can continue and unmistakably continue down this road of growing fascism and policing or it can be created in, you know, in the image of the people. 
We are here today because it is clear that no amount of reform could ever heal a system that is sick to the root. The system is not broken, rather it is working as it is intended to. So now today, abolition is the compromise. So I wanna invite you all again to just stay on this call with an open mind and an open heart and remember who we are fighting for and we will do this together. So I am very, very thankful to um, introduce our next speaker, our MC, um, Mackenzie, who is an organizer um, from Sacramento. Um, and yeah, I want to throw it to MC to, uh, I want to throw it to Mac to introduce themselves a little bit more and then um, we can go on with the rest of our call. So thank you all so much. Hey y'all, thanks so much for being here. Um, my name is Mac, uh, my pronouns are they, them. I'm in Sacramento, California. That's uh, Miwok, Miwok, Maidu and Nisan on land. Um, I am a local, I've been a local community organizer here in my town. I'd say a grassroots organizer and abolitionist um, and working towards those goals um, for the last five or six years. Um, and I wanna give thanks to the league because I have been studying that long with this organization and learning to aim what I wanted, the work that I wanna do. And um, so it's helped me work with groups like Decarcerate Sacramento, the Sacramento Tenants Union, the Sacramento Anti-Repression Committee, um, Anti-Police Terror Project Sacramento. Um, just, it's such a blessing to be here. So thank you so much. I'm more excited actually to talk to you guys about our upcoming speakers um, and the things that we're gonna do today. Um, I wanna give some quick um, bios for who's on the call and who you're gonna be talking to. Um, first up is my comrade, I love you so much, um, here with me at Dakar State Sacramento, Tiffany Russell Moyer. Um, she's a civil rights attorney whose work supports social justice movements. She is the Thoroughgood, uh, Thoroughgood Marshall Civil Rights Fellow at Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights of Sacramento, San Francisco Bay Area. Um, there she leads her team's work against violent policing and carceral systems. Tiffany uses strategic litigation, policy advocacy, direct services, and organizing on behalf of people of color in Northern California. For example, she litigates cases where people have been targeted and brutalized by police um, violence, publishes reports on the, on the profound and dangerous impacts of low-level policing, and has designed successful campaigns that um, compelled multiple California cities to drop charges against protesters after the summer of 2020 uprisings. Previously, um, Tiffany worked for the Disability Rights California, where she investigated and litigated cases regarding dangerous conditions of jail, psychiatric institutions, juvenile detention centers, and cases regarding Black people's access to mental health care in their communities. Tiffany also regularly provides legal support to grassroots abolitioni um, abolitionist organizations in Sacramento County. Thank you for being here, Tiffany. Hi, if you wanna. Um, next up, we're going to introduce you to Brian Canada. Brian is a founding chapter member of California um, for California Coalition for Women Prison, CCWP, Los Angeles. He has spent the last decade monitoring, challenging, and exposing the abuse of conditions inside women's prisons and advocating for the rights of incarcerated people. A tireless fundraiser for prison abolition, Brian's development work. <laughs> yeah, you're so dope. I'm so excited you're here. Um, Brian's development work. Uh, sorry, somebody just texted me and I'm reading from my phone. But sorry, uh. Brian. <laughs> development work has been wildly recognized. Brian became Curb staff in January of 2019 and was selected to join the 2019 to 2021 SVP Systems Change Accelerator cohort of emerging Los Angeles leaders. In 2020, he joined the steering committee of Reimagine LA and helped pass Measure J. Brian became Curb's deputy director in 2021 and was, and was elected community co-chair of LA's County Measure J subcommittee on health, mental health, behavioral health, and diversion. Next, I'm gonna bring up da um, Damon Williams. This is such a privilege. They're a movement builder organizer, hip hop performing artist, educator, and media maker from the South Side of Chicago. He's a co-director for the Let Us Breathe Collective, an artist activist organization birthed out of supply trips to support the Ferguson uprising in resistance to the murder of Mike Brown. 
Williams and Let Us Breathe trans transplanted the experiences from the front lines and continue to organize direct actions, community enrichment events through the streets of Chicago and in their movement building community center, the breathing room space. With the mission of utilizing cultural production and popular education to redistribute power and resources, eradicate system violence and transform inequality. In the summer of 2020, Damien, or I'm sorry, Damon co-created the Black Abolitionist and launched Defund CPD, a mass redistributive um, campaign aiming to redirect and resources, or I'm sorry, redirect power and resources away from the Sh Chicago Police Department. Damon is also the co-host of Ergo, a radio show and podcast co showcasing culture workers reshaping Chicago and beyond for the more equitable and creative. I, like I said, I wanna thank you guys so much for being here today. Like this is gonna be so much fun. Um, and just to move on, cause I wanted to read that text message. Um, so I just wanna give a quick overview of the panel progress and or like and how we're gonna do this today. Um, so we're gonna do two rounds with everybody, okay? We're gonna do two rounds of some questions. We have three questions. Um, and then we want you guys to be able to ask some questions. And so if you want, you can please put your questions in the chat and we'll be calling on you to ask your questions from the mic. We are gonna ask that you keep your questions short. We wanna make room for all of us. Um, so, so in the chat, if you would just like to say, I have a question for, and then you say who it is for, um, your name, where you're from, and your preferred pronoun. Like I said, mine are they, them. Uh, we'll be going to the audience questions after our two rounds and the responses. Um, we'd like each question or each panelist to respond for about five to seven minutes to the first two questions in the round. Um, and I do wanna make an announcement real quick because I think that's what this is about. Um, we as the league and the folks who are putting this call on and things like that, we have an upcom we have some upcoming um, announcements just to talk about the upcoming things that we're doing to continue on this beautiful conversation that we're gonna have today. Um, first, I wanna mention like, um, it's a, this is the first in a three parts dialogue connecting abolition of the police and the carceral state, the abolition of private property and the reconstruction of a new society. So again, thank you all for being here today. I'm excited to get started. On June 5th, we are actually gonna have our next abolitionist discussion with a special guest, um, Candace Mallet, an amazing freelance political writer and author of the column Black Canary and more. So please save that date for that discussion on June 5th. Then July 17th, our final third abolition discussion we're super honored to be able to bring Ruth Wilson Gilmore, an abolitionist scholar and organizer and one of the co-founders of Critical Resistance. You can find that information um, at our league website at learna.org or um, for flyers and registration very, very soon. Like I said, um, July 17th. All right, you guys, are you guys ready to get started? Are you folks ready? I'm super juiced for it. This is gonna be so cool. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, and co-founder of Curb, I see that in the chat. The Fred's the first chat I've gotten to read because I'm, you know, going so fast. Um, but yeah, cool. I, yeah, duh, I did know that. Okay. And co-founder of Curb. All right, you guys. So here are the first two questions that we're going to go through. One, please talk about the defund or abolitionist work that you are currently engaged in. What are you working on and what have been some recent wins and challenges? And then two, what changes in society do you think are helping to drive the current defund abolition slash abolitionist movement? They like said, we're gonna go through the round to, to each panelist and we're gonna go for about five to seven minutes. And I'm gonna be so captivated that I'm gonna try to keep the time. <laughs> Um, so if we could maybe teamwork that, that'd be great. <laughs> um, let's start with Tiffany. Like I said, Tiffany is uh, Tiffany Rosemore is the Thoroughgood Marshall Civil Rights Fellow at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights of the San Francisco Bay Area, um, who works with me at Decar and all these cool people I see names in the chat at Decarcerate at Sacramento. Um, do you want me to ask it again to you, Tiff? Okay, the first one. Um, so and just combine them together, okay? Just kind of talk about it. Like, what work do you do? 
What are you currently engaged in? That, and what are the recent wins and challenges? And what changes in society is helping drive the current movement that we have going? Oh, there we go. I could not unmute myself. I didn't have autonomy over my voice. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I love you too, Mac. Thanks for um, introducing me in that way. I it's such a joy to be here. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the other two uh, panelists today talk. Um, so I'm going to break it down and, and kind of my day job and then my all time never ceases <laughs> work. Um, my day job is a Thurgood Civil Rights Fellow. Um, on a day to day basis, what I'm doing is just engaging in a creative process, trying to figure out how to use this white supremacist system called the legal profession and all of the legal system and mold it in such a way that can um, reduce harm and uplift work that's happening in the movement. So I do use litigation as kind of my weapon of choice because it just kind of uses the skills that I am really good at and really like doing. Um, but I also engage in policy work. Um, some of the work that I'm doing is looking at um, Oakland Housing Authority has a, its own police department, and which means that they're being uh, residents of that police department are being doubly policed from their Oakland Housing Authority Police Department as well as Oakland Police Department and looking at the different ways in which we can support residents in creating an environment, a world, a community where they actually feel safe um, because over policing obviously is not that. Um, also, um, I have work in both San Jose and Sacramento regarding changing the, the dynamics and how the city, the municipality interacts with people who are exercising their right to free speech who are protesting and what ways can we use litigation that doesn't contribute to um, expanding law enforcement and their resources and instead mm -hmm. reduces the contact law enforcement with the public altogether, um, which is not something that I've seen done in litigation before. <laughs> so it is, like I said, a creative process all throughout. And uh, finally, uh, what I'll say about that is about 30% of my job is mitigating the harm that lawyers do, <laughs> um, you know, and really trying to redirect um, my colleagues, other, other lawyers and saying like, actually, we, we can't be the heroes here. That doesn't make any sense for this context. And what you're asking for is undermining um, the movement that young black and brown people are building. My all time never ceases work and where uh, Mac and I have the privilege to work together is in Decarcerate Sacramento. Um, and Decarcerate Sacramento is a, a coalition that, that formed almost two years ago at this point to intervene and stop the county's plans to expand its carceral system. Um, and really to push them and us to build the system that we want um, to, to better invest in health and joy. We've had some wins where we've stopped three times now the county's plans to build a bigger facility um, and have fr frankly changed the dialogue where now the conversation is how do we dramatically reduce the jail population in a sustainable way um, so that it's not so expensive to house our people in cages. Um, I think the second uh, question was about um, what drives the work. Um, and I'll just throw out some disability justice framework from what I'm seeing. I think um, people since the pandemic are really adjusting their life and putting more emphasis on what they need individually on a day-to-day -day basis um, and things that they don't wanna do with anymore once we quote unquote go back to normal. And I think that that has really facilitated a lot of conversations in my world around what abolition really means, around what, if we had control over the narrative, we had control over the monies, what that might look like. Um, and that has fundamentally changed the conversations that I've been able to have both in my work and in my private life. I agree, actually, I've noticed it, you know, just like a, as a, there is a, I don't wanna call it an awakening or something, you know, but I mean, but it's like a, but I think it's like our, actually, I think it's the collective consciousness. You know what I mean? Like we all already knew and then now it's like all of us. And so it's like this really beautiful thing. So I hear you, I'm so thankful for that as well. Um, now let's go to Damon. Um, like I said, Damon is the co-director of Let Us Breathe Collective in Chicago. Same questions. Would you like me to ask them again? No, I got it. Um, hey everybody, again, my, my name is Damon. He, him, and in a space such as this, we pronouns. Um, and yeah, in addition to the Let Us Breathe Collective, uh, I also work with an organization called the Chicago Torture Justice Center. And I'm also a co-founder uh, co of an organizational coalition uh, here in Chicago that's called R3, 
reimagine, uh, rebuild, um, resist, reimagine, rebuild Chicago, uh, which is a part of the rising majority, which is a national formation connected to the movement for Black Lives. So I also want to bring that into this space. Um, and I just wanted to take a second because, you know, our nation has been looking at Chicago for the past few hours um, as there was the traumatic release of the video of the killing of Adam Toledo, uh, who was 13 years old and, you know, just a few miles away from a core of a lot of my work has been. Um, so I just want to take a breath uh, for him and his family and having been at a rally last night um, in his honor, that is, that is fresh for me. Um, so to some of the wins um, and some of the work, uh, one, you know, building space. So Let Us Breathe Collective has, has a movement building. We call it Liberation Oasis on the South Side called Breathing Room, where we're able to do programming, tribe and community building. Um, one of the biggest of uh, victories that is always intention and contradiction is um, we're approaching six years now uh, of the anniversary of the passing of a reparations ordinance in Chicago, which was historic. It was the first passage of any reparations of police violence in the United States, particularly against black people. If the, the name John Burge may ring out as a national villain um, and a 25 year torture reign where, where, where men and women spent decades uh, locked up based off forced confession. So just this past, Two weeks ago, uh, we 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 got the release of Gerald Reed, uh, one of our um, political prisoners and survivors of torture, and so always doing that work. And that is where you know uh, my employment is now is is with um, the the work that came out of that historic ordinance, um, and continued work around com incommunicado detention. And just this year, we abolished cash bail in the state of Illinois uh, with the ordinance called the Pretrial Fairness Act. Um, but a lot of my work in the past year, uh, after experiencing personal abuse at the, the start of Uprising, uh, has been through forming the Black Abolitionist Network and the Defund CPD campaign. Um, and with that, we got, so I don't know how like tuned in y'all is to Chicago out there, but like Lori Lightfoot is a monster. Uh, and this is our mayor is, 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 is pretty horrible in every way. Uh, but with that, uh, 23 of our 50 uh, members of, of city council uh, voted against her budget last year, which had never been done before, almost reversing it. And so that's not a capital W win, but that's significant and speaks to the fact that 87% of Chicagoans filled out the formal budget survey, um, uplifting the, the divest, invest, defund platform, right? So there's significant transformation that's happening in the city. I would say, you know, Adam who invited me could, could, uh, could be a testament to this. Uh, we went from a few dozen in 2014 to 2015 to now in defund, organizing thousands of people actively through direct action, through mutual aid, through um, civic engagement and through, you know, radical community building. Um, and so to the question of kind of like the why now or what is special about this moment and why I'm so grateful to be invited into this space um, because this was my answer before I even like heard some of the openings. Um, the difference is the reemergence of the revolutionary process. Um, we, we, you know, this is a long, long tradition, uh, but the, the repression and the internal contradictions of the mid 20th century were so massive that it took generations for us to recover. Um, and so we are gradually poking our head above ground. And I feel pretty strongly uh, that people can't fully comprehend the expansive philosophy that is abolition without being grounded in understanding the history and also the ideology of revolution. Um, and so the fact that there has been this heightened contradiction that I've seen in the chat and in the communication, what I have like one minute left, I I'm about to finish up. Um, <laughs> uh, I I've, you know, I think we all recognize locally, nationally, globally, there has been a heightening of contradictions, the, the obvious nature of how, uh, you know, capitalism and our social systems work are, are proven. The evidence is that they are anti-life and destructive. And so as we had new technology to be able to communicate and build with protected space some of these revolutionary ideas, we have this new collective consciousness. There are these, all these, the fact that we are able to have these Zooms speaks to the fact that they are cadres, intentional bodies, informal bodies that are coming together and taking a higher responsibility for transforming the world and creating a deeper level of humanity. Um, so I wanna shout out the, the liberatory revolutionary lineage that I ground my work in. And I think that we can all take example from, uh, I consider myself of the Bogzian tradition, um, so, so my mentor, um, an entry point into radical consciousness was a student of, of Jimmy and Grace Lee Boggs based out of Detroit. 
I recommend everybody read the text Revolution, Evolution, the 20th Century. I'm also grounded in the Ella Baker tradition. I'm deeply grounded in the tradition of the Panthers. Um, and so here in Chicago, uh, we have the, our iconic martyr of Fred Hampton, but that definitely connects us to the Bay Area in Northern California with Huey and Elaine, and you know, obviously the, the, the locus of th that beautiful legacy. Um, and also wanna shout out the MOVE organization in Philadelphia and then Critical Resistance in the Black Radical Congress, right? And so those nodes, and obviously there's hundreds, if not thousands of other experiments and efforts in between those spaces, but those nodes created a, a, a continuum and a lineage that we were able to reactivate as we had the technology to communicate and meet each other. Because all these people that I didn't know seven years ago, I basically only speak to people who are living in, in resistance to, to the carceral state. Um, and that would not have been possible with our technological reality when I was born. Uh, and so we are living in new possibilities, which has given us the space to come together to imagine even further new possibilities that we can push and struggle dialectically towards. So that's why I think we are in the midst of the largest uprising ever. And everybody in the world is now being provoked to talk about the fact that police, prisons, and militaries should be a part of our past. Thanks, and I'll check back in a second. Whew, so good. I just, I was like, fuck yes, the whole time. <laughs> um, uh, and actually, like that, you know, one of my dearest friends, um, Nikki, actually, we were speaking about that, and like, and the word, the words that she gave me were, um, we stand upon the shoulders of giants, you know, and like, and like, and, uh, and I give thanks too for the, for the, the breath of new, you know, fresh air that has been given to like a fire that has always been burning. Um, and that brings me to curb, you know, actually <laughs> that brings me to curb. One of those giants, you know, that those shoulders that we get to stand upon even as to incarcerate Sacramento. Um, so I'm gonna bring it um, over to Brian. Brian, same questions. Again, one wow. more time. Brian is the deputy director, yeah. I'm a good company. Um, and thanks for um, calling out Curb. Um, we've been around since 2003 and, you know, with deep, deep building by people like Ruthie and, and so many greats. Um, uh, I think really Curb, the shoulders that we're standing on through Curb really help um, inform this divest and best conversation that's really taking place. And, and yeah, I'm Brian. Hi, um, I use he and they, and I'm the deputy director of CURB, which is Californians United for a Responsible Budget. And CURB is um, an 80 member uh, coalition of organizations who are committed to reducing the number of people in prisons and jails, reducing the number of prisons and jails in the state, and shifting wasteful spending away from incarceration and toward things that actually keep people safe, like housing, healthcare, jobs, all the good stuff. Curb is in deep, deep statewide work right now, calling for the closure of all prisons in California in the interests of public health and racial justice. Um, and I'm, I'm Curb's coordinator in LA County. I serve on the executive team of Justice LA, uh, who through community stopped LA County's $3.5 billion plan for jail expansion. I was also part of the steering committee for Measure J, um, which passed by overwhelming margins in 2020. I served on Measure J's coordinating committee as part of the Reimagine LA Coalition. So Measure J says that 10% of all of LA County's net county costs have to go towards alternatives to incarceration um, or direct community investment. Um, I've been leading Reimagine's health policy work group. And I also was elected in a county process to be the co-chair of the health, mental health and diversion subcommittee earlier this year, which is a grueling five week process that is somehow still continuing past all of the weeks, um, which passed monumental proposals um, despite ridiculous opposition, including an approved recommendation to close Men's Central Jail that allocates $200 million to community-based care and treatment. But it's step one of only hundreds of steps that will be necessary to bring that to fruition. You know, and obviously for generations, LA County has been ravaged by the carceral system um, with so many of our people criminalized um, and harm left to fester while LA, one of the largest jailers in the world, if not the largest, just locked people away and spent billions of dollars annually on over-policing. Um, 
we in LA County though, we're in the midst of a pivotal moment in reimagining public safety um, as this national movement for shifting dollars from jails and communities gains traction. I think LA um, is very much an incubator and we're positioned to be in the forefront um, through our pursuit and acknowledgement of a care first vision. Um, this process, like I was saying around Jay has been really, really fraught. Um, we have serious concerns about the way in which it's unfolding. And right now, basically we're demanding that the Board of Supervisors make sure that they do what Measure J was intended to do, which is fully fund the community-based systems of care necessary to free our people. Through the entire process, the county refused to give us an estimate of what the budget allocation would be. Um, they refused for months and our analysis had it between 600 million and a billion dollars of community investment. And after weeks and weeks and weeks of this subcommittee process making recommendation after recommendation, we were informed that the year one allocation for Jay would only be $100 million, and that basically we should be thankful for that. Um, and that the CEO estimated that the full 10% allocation of Measure J funds would only be $300 million when fully phased in. So they're trying to steal the people's money, y'all, as usual. Um, and we believe that the analysis that led to this low number um, is not only flawed, but represents a legal misinterpretation. Um, so, you know, we're about to get litigious up and through here, kind of call Tiffany, figure out how to get them. Um, and what's really important is the board link, um, the passing of Measure J to all of the work um, that has been built in LA County by our mentors, by our youth, um, by those that came before us, those we walk with. Um, as part of a continuum, we passed Measure R, which is Sheriff Accountability. Um, the Alternatives to Incarceration work group was created in LA County. We stopped the jail plan and Measure J is supposed to fund these solutions that community created. These aren't disparate things. So you can't just build out the system of care without focusing on the decarceration element right now. According to the RAND report, there's about 4,000 people trapped in LA County jails who are legally able to be diverted. They've been approved to, for mental health diversion. There's just simply nowhere to go. Um, and obviously you can't get well in a cell. So, you know, while we're fighting with the county, um, black and brown people, especially black women, um, are suffering and dying inside of these horrible, horrible, horrible places. Um, so, you know, we won big, but the county don't make it easy, y'all. Um, and all of our quotes have, all of our, all of our wins have quotes around them. I think sometimes, I think Damon said, win with a small W. Sometimes it feels like that, even, even when you win big. Uh, gosh, I talked a lot. What's part two? Did I run over my time? What are the changes? Yeah, well, yeah, it's um, the second question was, what changes in society do you think mm. are helping drive that current defund abolition movement? Yeah, I mean, I think folks named it like 2020 has revealed what everybody kind of already, well, not everybody, but what marginalized people have known for decades, which is that incarceration and racism are economic and public health crises, intersectional public health and, and racist crises. Um, the biggest shift, I think, which is cool, is that um, people have re realized that budgets are a statement about our values. So budgets are sexy now, which I like. That's going to be Curb's new t-shirt. Budgets are finally sexy. Um, and there's a greater awareness that it's time to invest in real solutions to the systems of inequality that, um, that uniquely endanger people that are disproportionately policed and targeted, TGI folks, Black people, Indigenous people, you know, our people. Um, and as California wastes billions of dollars on revenue, of revenue, um, on prisons and detention centers built to solve problems that are actually socioeconomic, um, you know, people continue to fall victim or to survive California's culture of perpetual punishment and austerity. And I think, you know, I think Mac might have said this, that like people kind of knew it, but like now like you have to look at it. And if you refuse to look at it, like mm, there's something wrong with you, girl. You're on mute, Mac. 
<laughs> that's funny. I thought I, it's funny. I've been pressing it with my mouse the whole time, but then it finally was like, you can press space bar. That'll work. And it just didn't. Yeah. Um, yeah. Those were, man, um, I was getting to the part of like how amazing you guys were and the, or how much, how amazing you folks are. Like, um, and how it's such an honor just to have like gotten to even hear about all of these things. And I agree with you, you know, like there's something there's something and if they're and if you're not paying attention then yeah what then what you know like what 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 is happening and how how do we make this more accessible because i think it's a really that says something about us and our movement then <laughs> you know like why why are you not screaming why you know from the rooftops housing is a human right with us you know like, like I, what's going on there <laughs> um so we're going to move into our second round to our second question we are going to bring on a fourth panelist kimberly king um they are a member of the league. Um, Kimberly, and I'm sure it says this in this bio too, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Kimberly is a community college instructor, instructor and co-founder of Black Minds Matter at Peralta, a group of faculty and students that use the defund and invest approach to successfully eliminate the county sheriffs as the, county, as the campus police in the Peralta school district or college district, and is now pushing to put in place a holistic safety and wellness approach that includes restorative justice training for the campus community, uh, more mental health services, low cost and free student housing, and other basic student needs. Kimberly is a member of the League of Revolutionaries for a New America and serves on the editorial board for the League's newspaper rally comrades. Welcome, Kimberly. So here's the question for our second round. We ask that you just take about three to five minutes to respond and then we wanna be able to open up to our audience. Um, we're gonna go is, and then to the audience, I just wanna say, um, please put your questions for the panelists in the chat. We'll be selecting some of the questions and inviting you to ask it out loud. Questions will be selected based on the flow of the conversation and time. And I will be calling on audience members to share their question for the panelists out loud. Um, a reminder, please take no longer than you know, 15, 30 seconds to ask your question so that we can get as many of these in and get as many answers out as possible. Um, here's what to do if you'd like to ask a question one more time. Just go ahead and write it in the chat. Your, who your question is for, your first name, where you're from, and your preferred pronoun. All right, you ready? Is full abolition of the police and prison industrial complex possible without abolishing white supremacy, capitalism, and private property? I know it's a little, it's a, it's kind of, a, it's a long one, but I know, and I'm like, only three to five minutes. <laughs> but here we go. Um, Brian, we'll start with you if that's all right. Sure, gosh. Um, I know. Well, trying to think of the lens to use. Well, so I don't identify as a Marxist, but I don't disidentify as a Marxist, but I'm invested in ways that in, in what ways can we de-fetishize capitalism and continue to, you know, learn from friends for non on how best not to dissolve race and class into one another. Um, so of course, difficult to deny, to deny that anything other than capitalist white supremacy is the, like the earth's fuel for systemic racism. And while understanding the difference between the abolition of, you know, private, property versus personal property. Primarily, I feel like I spend my time thinking about how to stop Black people from dying this very day under capitalism. And for me, that has to look like a massive transfer of wealth uh, to Black and marginalized communities and building intergenerational wealth for Black people. So if that work can be done through the lens of liberation, and I think it absolutely must be, and what that lens is, is abolition, um, we'll probably get to the right place. Um, you know what I will say in the past few days, there has been this question of like, how can a Marxist own a house? Um, and I think it's kind of a silly thing to be focused on right now and really sort of fetishizes black poverty. Um, and not that there, own, there isn't always room for accountability around stuff like that, but I think it's really distracting from the conversations that need to be centered right now about the immediate death of our people and like the murders of 13 year old kids. Um, 
And, you know, I'm not sure how we get to an end in policing without an end to private property, because that's kind of the point. But um, real talk, we're not totally sure about how to get to any of these things we're talking about. Abolition is a compass. It's not a map, you know? And that's why you need a decent imagination, because we're the people that got to figure this shit out. And under capitalism, I want Black people, especially, to be able to live their lives to the fullest. I'm, I'm a community organizer and a fundraiser, so I'm about taking the white people's money. I'm interested in wealth transfer, um, and I want to help people build power. And I feel focused about, you know, propelling us towards a socioeconomic system that doesn't oppress people. Um, and I think I know what that is, but, you know, convince me. Um, now let's go to Tiffany. I love this question. And um, also whether, <laughs> I'm just still laughing about entering spaces and identifying with which theorist <laughs> you wanna follow in the path for li liberation and joy. Um, um, I have to say that what's become so apparent to me over the years in this work is that white supremacy and racial capitalism allow for the systems to continue replicating themselves, right? The incentives that these systems create allow us to justify outrageous behavior in order to protect capital and profit. Um, and the most obvious of that, which I'm sure all of us will allude to, Brian certainly did, was is that the current carceral system is just a replication of the institution of slavery, right? And so <laughs> the, one of the reasons why you can justify some of the just violent aspects of it is because it's profitable, right? And so with, how do we remove those types of incentives and then get to the abolition of the prison industrial complex? I don't think we can under this, under this system. Um, the, the example that's coming to mind immediately because we're in the thick of it yet again is, is thinking about Sacramento's mayor. Sacramento Mayor Steinberg just recently put out this video talking about one type of protest is okay, the other type of protest not so much, you know, violence and the destruction of property won't be tolerated. And so we go to a place where somebody's security camera in their front yard is justifiable now for law enforcement to indiscriminately put um, fire of impact munitions into crowds, people losing eyes permanently, permanently altering the trajectory of young people's lives as a result of this. People who, who were impacted, um, hit in the head. Some of our, our dear, dear friends in, in Sacramento, this permanent brain damage, just destroying, eradicating the dreams that this person had for their future. And all of that is justifiable to our officials because they wanna protect uh, property and they wanna protect capital. And how do we move outside of that without getting rid of the system? I, I frankly don't think it's possible. Um, and I just so deeply appreciate what you're saying, Brian, about we don't necessarily know. We know what we're doing, but we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> you know, we're really trying to go through a creative process and sticking to our values, um, which for me is really protecting folks' access to joy. Right? Um, I have no idea how long that felt like a real rant, so I'm going <laughs> to pass it on. No, it's so good. It's so good. And like, and I think you, like, I think you, you both in, are going to hit, are hitting on the head, like, and even abolition, like, like abolition just means the willingness to try something new. You know what I mean? Like that, that is all that it means. You know what I mean? Like, and, and how to get there is just by trying. And, and I think that is something that's so inspiring about, about the folks on this, this call is like, you are folks who are trying. Um, can we hear from you, David? Come on. Um, so do you think that um, is full abolition possible without abolishing capitalism, white supremacy, and private property? Word, word. Okay, I'm noting time. It's 153. So I'm, I'm at the 158 mark is what I'm uh, shooting for. Because uh, I have a simple answer and then a complex answer, and I think I could do them both concisely. Um, so the obvious and simple answer is no. <laughs> um, uh, but I want to do like a little like 45 to 90 second teach in on how I think through and frame this question. So I don't know if folks can see my little, can you see my little drawing? 
Um, so I want to reframe it back in the notion, and I'm going to pull it up back up in a second, of revolution, right? Um, because I believe abolition is a technology of liberation, and the, the ultimate project of liberation is revolution. And so when we talk about revolution, you have to understand that the police and prisons and racial capitalism exists within a superstructure, and that is the nation state. Um, and so in talking about abolishing police, I want to ground it in the structure. So I, I draw this little triangle and I invite anybody to steal it. So in the middle here, you can see the nation state is like the name of this base. And up top, we have racial capitalism, which helps us complicate the relationship between race and class. Is this, can y'all see? Just to make sure. Okay, I'm gonna put my face there too. So racial capitalism allows us to have a complex understanding between the relation of race and class and how that perpetuates these oppressive systems of the nation state. And then down here, we have carceral militarism. And these are on a line. These are connected, right? So carceral militarism is a language I use so we don't have to keep saying prisons, comma, police, comma, private security, comma, borders, comma, military, right? All of that fits into the dynamic and intersection of carceral militarism. And then over here, if y'all can see, is cishet patriarchy, right? So we have racial capitalism, carceral militarism, cishet patriarchy in this little triangle. They are all in interconnected, continuous lines. And so the abolition, the revolution and creating beyond this nation state system that's been oppressing people so we can say maybe 5,000 years is going to take opposing these interconnected dynamics. And that is a way that I simplify. And it's like, what is anti-oppression? At its highest form, this is the way that I understand it. So no, right, is the answer um, very simply. But I want to give a more complex uh, depth um, because I ground my, my understanding of abolition. I'm going to use a little uh, analogy. I don't know, just from my like pre-radical sports boy days. Um, I don't know if there are any NBA fans, but I, I call Angela Davis like the Bill Russell of abolition. And I call like Ruth Wilson Gilmore, like the Michael Jordan. And then there's Miriam Kaba, who was a deep teacher and shaped so much of what we're doing here in Chicago. She's like a LeBron, right? She's like the, the right here, right now. Um, so those are like the three greatest thinkers that I go to. And one of the things Miriam makes sure that we're really intentional about is we can't get stuck on police and the cops. When we're talking about abolition, it is about policing. And so with that, carcerality exists beyond buildings with barbed wires. And so we have to understand that the same dialectics that are moving us is also moving the counter-revolutionary nation state. And so it is always expanding, it is always changing, it is always absorbing and reacting to us. And so with that, it is possible that we could legislate the divestment and redistribution away from the current carceral institutions and that that carcerality could be transferred into other institutions. And more importantly, policing can exist within us, right? So our schools could become carceral, our hospitals can become carceral, our, our housing associations can become carceral. And in those relationships, it might not be a person with a badge that the mayor is the boss of. It could be a private force. It could be a locally organized thing. It could be a fascist right wing militia. Policing can exist beyond you know, the, the structures that are the institutions that we know. Um, and so I just want us to give us that challenge of you know, history tells us even when we end this, these systems of oppression, there will always be new forms of oppression that we have to work through. And so to re-ground myself in the bogs, there is no final struggle. There is no promised land. We are going to always be in this process and our environment is always going to provide new contradictions and limitations. But the simple answer is yes, if we want to get rid of police and prisons, we got to get rid of racial capitalism and property and all that bullshit. All right. Thank you. <laughs> just so much fire. I'm like, yeah. Um, next up, we're going to bring up Kimberly. All right. Thank you. It was a, it's an honor to be uh, here with you all on this panel. And I love the idea of talking about it as access to joy. I love that. Um, so I agree. The answer is no. Uh, the police, <laughs> the police and the prison industrial cap, cap, uh, complex, capitalism and white supremacy and private property are all connected and they all must be abolished if humanity and the earth is going to survive. Um, 
Slavery, I've prepared some comments, so I'm going to go through them. Slavery in the United States, as everybody knows, was a brutal system of labor exploitation where enslaved Black people were considered property, like a plow or a horse, and could legally be beaten, tortured, dismembered, raped, sold away from their parents, partners, or children, and until 1821, legally killed by their so-called owners in most states. Slavery was used, as Tiffany mentioned, because it was profitable. It was extremely profitable. It created more millionaires per capita in the Mississippi Delta than anywhere else in the nation in 1861. The South cotton industry made up, ARC, Southern uh, countries cotton industry made up two thirds of the world's cotton supply at the end of the, by the beginning of the Civil War. And if the Confederacy had been its own country, it would have been the fourth richest nation in the world. The US became a leading global economy because of stealing the labor of Africans and selling them as commodities, which was also very profitable, worth $4 billion by the end of the Civil War, the cost of slaves. Because of the central role of the enslavement of Africans, and the genocide and land theft of the indigenous people. White supremacy is embedded in capitalism in the United States. Racism, oppression based on lies about race, that's how I'm defining racism, oppression based on lies about race, was created to justify slavery and genocide in a country where our founding documents said that all men were created equal. Slavery and stolen land built the wealth of this country from the start, and they're still here in the system of systemic racism intertwined with capitalism today. Some call it racial capitalism, as people have said. Ruth Wilson Gilmore says, capitalism requires inequality and racism enshrines it. Capitalism requires inequality and racism enshrines it. Capitalism is a system of private property where society's resources are held in the private hands of an owning class and kept from the rest of us. Workers with jobs sell our labor to the capitalists and they pay us to buy our necessities from them. The capitalists exploit our labor and make profit from that exploitation. Now, if many of us don't have a job or don't make enough money to buy food, housing, and health care, then we starve, become homeless, or get sick and die. And Reverend William Barber of the Poor People's Campaign says there's about 140 million people in that situation today that are poor. And all of this is perfectly legal under a private property system, just like slavery was legal. It is legal for some people to have everything while others have nothing. And today, the development of advanced technology, automation, computers, AI, robotics, is changing things even more. New technology is replacing jobs every day, which makes it harder and harder for people to earn enough money to, bake, to get their basic necessities. Under end-stage capitalism, there's very little safety net for the unemployed. The capitalist class, because of this technology, no longer needs a surplus worker, no longer needs to support them with a safety net. They need fewer actual workers in the new economy, and this is creating a new abolitionist class, a class of unemployed and underemployed workers that must abolish private property in order to survive. Our society is fighting out an economic revolution, the class between labor replacing power of the new te digital technology and a society organized around jobs. Society needs to transform and reorganize around its capacity to produce without exploitation. History puts the descendants of African-American slaves at the core of the new growing abolitionist class of workers of all colors that is created by labor replacing technology. This class must fight for a new society, not based on private property, but based on cooperation sharing and the distribution according to need. It's not about Marxism, it's about a practical solution to the problems that we face. We could all have healthy, thriving communities if the wealth of society, which we and all of our ancestors created, were shared for the benefit of all, rather than held in the hands 
by private property in the hands of a few. In the hands of the people, we could produce plenty of healthy food, quality housing, healthcare, education, joy. We do not have to have, we do not have a scarcity problem. We have a private property problem. And the people's demands for defunding and abolishing the police and the military carceral system and investing resources in communities is part of the solution. The police and prisons are there to control us. They protect private property and the owners of capital. They are part of a new fascism that's developing in our country and around the world. This is developing to stop the motion of the new abolitionist class to create the society we need. The police and the carceral state care more about a $20 counterfeit bill or store windows being broken than a 13 year old boy being murdered by police. They care more about that than they care about the conditions of government neglect in our communities that put young children and families in precarious and dangerous situations. The police don't work for us. They ain't here to protect and serve us. They work for the ruling class to control us and yes, to terrorize us. Fascism is rising to oppose our movements to defund and abolish the police, to abolish ICE, to abolish homelessness, to cancel rent, to cancel student debt, to provide health care and education for all, and to protect the earth and all living things. These things require a reconstruction of society in the interests of the vast majority of people. The power of our movements, as everybody's talking about, and our unity, which we are seeing with those 26 million people, this threatens private property. And fascism is arising to maintain private property. The 26 million people of all colors who went into the streets last summer risking their lives during a pandemic in response to the police murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many others shows our power. Our movement is growing in numbers, in strength, and in consciousness. If we continue to come together, think together, organize together to get the political power needed to reconstruct society, we will win. Abolitionist scholar, abolitionist scholar and organizer Ruth Wilson Gilmore says, abolition is about more than just tearing down the cages. It is about having the resources and care people need to survive and live well. That's what we're fighting for. And we must help more and more people to understand this in order to win. Thank you. Amazing. And I really like that you hit it on the head when you said uh, capitalism requires the inequalities. Like it literally requires somebody to not be able to have something while well, somebody else can. And that when we are almost kind of objectively, and I don't want to scare anybody, but communist class, when we're screaming, housing is a human right, Medicare for all, free education. I mean, we're, we, we do have ideas. You know, no more xenophobia, you know what I mean? No more transphobia, queerphobia. No, you know, we, we have these ideas of what it kind of looks like, you know, and I'm excited to be a part uh, in this moment in time to create spaces that say no to these things and I'm prepared to fight back against the extreme amounts of fascism that we are gonna see. The attacks on our democracy, they're gonna have to take our vote from us and things like that to be able to try and keep us from these spaces. But like to just see it happening everywhere in a way that I've never gotten to see it before, knowing that it had always existed there. Like, it's cool. Um, so to the audience, um, we're gonna move on to kind of like talk about some questions that you guys put in there. So please put your questions for the panelists in the chat. Um, we just ask that you take no more than a couple of seconds to ask your questions so that we can get as many as possible. Um, and like I said, if you'd like to ask a question, just go ahead and put question four, write your first name, where you're from, and your preferred pronouns, so that way I can call on you and ask you to, to come up. Um, first, we would like to offer you a, an awesome uh, performance coming to you from an amazing um, artist and member of the League, uh, Adam. Um, I think oh, no, I'm sorry. Damon no, Damon. Damon's doing this one. I'm sorry, Damon Williams. Okay. I got okay. you at the end. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Cool, okay. You're yeah, Damon's a hip-hop artist and he's gonna do a verse for us. Come on. 
Right, right. I, I appreciate this space and in this Zoom pandemic reality, that there's been much less of this. Uh, but but I, I would like to share uh, some words and some energy uh, that really emerged as we were at coming out of a peak of some of our abolitionist development here in Chicago uh, through through an action called Freedom Square, uh, where we lived across from the Home and Square torture facility here rooted in Chicago. Um, and for those who are unfamiliar, I, I really encourage y'all to, to look up some of that history. Um, and so some of this emerged coming out of that space. Welcome to the journey to freedom. Those before us left lessons, we gonna learn and repeat them. We not gonna follow directions because we know that they cheating. The game has been rigged, but into the code and you'll beat it. The no star ain't the brightest, but it's the one that you seen. Just follow your spirits because we was born with the secrets. We gonna, we gonna find what we seeking. Hearts gonna keep beating. Every day is the party. It don't just start on the weekend. We going harder than semen, marching, discarding our demons, bombarding the garden led by the daughters of Eden. We are all that we needed, clever and never defeated. We do it better together. They want us broken, competing. We defining this moment and giving life a new meaning. We defying the owners, open and bold with our treason. We be smoking and drinking cause we be coping with trauma, drama, mama fussing, cussing and little cousins be bleeding. All the homies be tweaking. We get locked up for no reason. Hunting us all year, we not just cuffed in the season, catching feelings, healing, but still throwing shade in the evening. If you saw the impossible, would that make you believe it? Boarding up our schools, they still don't want us reading, trying to shut us up. Cause they don't want us screaming, but we done woke up now. We'll show them what we've been dreaming. Oh, they got us fucked up. But here come the redeeming. Now stop. Move to the beat of my drum. Who can you feed with a crumb? And what can you grow with a seed? Your body don't burn in the sun. Build it up and then they'll come. Can't freely have fun with your funds. We know that freedom ain't free. We need role models and teachers for this world swallowing eaters. But it's hard to know who to follow when everyone around you's a leader. Do it for Darion and Adia, Dame Mo and Rakia. We'll fix it or break it down, but one way or another, they'll see us. What happened when bullshit's abolished? Well, hustles put kids through college. We learn money can't fix every problem, or we don't need their schools to get knowledge. But we still gonna grind for them dollars. Ain't no Leisha Kyle on my collar. The stories revise, we write in the lies. Don't rock and roll, but we got honor. Mm, rock and roll, no Madonna. Uh, no Rolling Stones, no Nirvana. I'm Chuck Berry, and I'm very white, and I'm very tight with my mama. And I got every right to go crazy. Them scary nights is what made me. But still I rise to still a prize to be ill-advised to try to play me. Thanks. But, but, but. No. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Yeah, so much. Oh, thank you very much for all that. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I just lost my place on my page. Okay. Um, so our first question is from Joe in Kentucky. Um, oh, I might not be Joe. <laughs> Sorry, I have one here. Um, question for Damon. And it doesn't have a name or a pronoun. So if I don't get those, you guys, I'm gonna have to do it for you, I'm sorry. Um, how do we articulate the nation state diagram to those who have traditionally hidden behind racial capitalism out of fear of loss or uh, of privilege and access to ilk perceived sustainability. That's great, thank you. So, I, and I appreciate all the love. I, I got a little, little thrown off there, but I'm gonna just hold up the diagram again. Sorry, I put a little bit of notes at the bottom, but if you can see this triangle with the nation state at the beginning, the question was about racial capitalism. Um, and I also saw another question of what's my definition of racial capitalism. I build this from Robin D.G. Kelly, who builds from Cedric Robinson and others. One, we still need to work collectively to define it is, is one thing that my, my teachers tell us. Uh, but my simplification is um, you should not be saying the words racism without capitalism. You shouldn't be saying the words capitalism without racism. Uh, those two systems as they currently exist, co-emerge has never been able to exist. And it's pretty theoretically sound to say that they won't be able to exist without each other. Um, so it's just a way to be more exact. So you don't have to say racism. So it's like the race versus class argument is ridiculous. And like, let's stop. It's much more complicated and they coexist. Um, and so to the question of folks with privilege, um, first, I want to, I'm going to ground in some of my own privilege, but also want to challenge that notion of privileged people within these oppressive systems. Uh, one, those privileges that we perceived are often toxic and or hollow um, in their nature um, and or imagined. 
Um, so a lot of them aren't even real. But even within that, most people who are experiencing some form of privilege, about 99.99% of the human population are also oppressed in some type of way. Um, and so I think it's important to ground in folks personal liberation and their personal position. And from there, you can find solidarity with all peoples of the world. So on this triangle, right, I think, again, it's very easy for us to see the line between racial capitalism and carceral and militarism of how they support each other. I'm to, to put myself in this, I'm going to come over here to the cishet patriarchy, you know, as a, as a man that grew up um, in normative society, um, absorbing patriarchal ideology, absorbing homophobia, absorbing transphobia. transphobia. Um, it wasn't until learning deeply about oppressions intersectionally um, was that understanding that my freedom is connected to all people. And if I could just start with all Black people, <laughs> even, if, even if it's hard to, to think about the whole world, um, the ways in which internalized oppression, like Black trans women, are, you know, are, are killed in a way that nobody else in our society is. So if I stand up for liberation. That means I need to be understanding who I am in solidarity with. Uh, and so in terms of this triangle and how we connect our privilege, I think after we understand it intellectually in that way of I is we and we is I, um, then it comes from relational learning. So I was fortunate to be in these liberal arts schools and to have these great mentors where I understood feminism, where I was able to see trans identity and gender nonconformity. Uh, but it wasn't until I started organizing, it wasn't until I, I, I spoke up and stepped up for Black liberation was in organizations like BYP 100 that relational learning could happen. So when I hear people who are privileged by white supremacy, by uh, racial capitalism, I'm hearing privileged white people is what I feel like is coming from that question. And so the way in which to be in solidarity with those who are oppressed by racial capitalism is to learn relationally. Um, and when it becomes not abstract and concrete, and you know people who are getting evicted and you know people whose um, parents, you know, houses got foreclosed and you know folks that have no access to healthcare, you can, it, it, it's not complicated. Um, and then from that relational learning, right? Cause other people's oppression is not our classroom. It goes to embodied practice. Um, and so as somebody who from a place of privilege stands up and tries to teach from a black queer feminist position because that is connected to carceral militarism, racial capitalism and the nation state. Um, it is because I have to show up in spaces with black trans women and black queer women, right? And so I have to be aligned in what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so seven years ago, I could probably have said these things or could have heard them and understood them. But the reason why I'm able to articulate it in a way that y'all appreciate is because of the community and the work that I've been with. So for folks who are privileged by oppressive systems, it's very simple. Your privilege is bullshit, so challenge it. You learn in relationship and then practice and be in alignment with, with embodied practice. Thanks. Mm. Um. The next person I'm going to call up to ask their question is Lou Rosenbaum. If I can remember the question, I can't see it in chat, but if I can remember the question, it was how do we use the abolitionist battle that we're engaged in to overcome the divisions that the ruling class is constantly forcing upon us? That's for all panelists. Can you repeat it again? Sure. Uh, how, how do we use the, the abolitionist struggle that we're all engaged in to overcome the divisions that the ruling class is constantly forcing upon us? And the most obvious one, of course, is the question that is, uh, uh, that is uh, imposed upon us through racial capitalism. So that's part of the question. I feel like Damon just answered that question, really. Um, it's through doing the work. That's my opinion anyway. It's through doing the work, um, through doing the work, uh, fighting for the things we actually need, the actual problems that we have, not thinking about it as ideology or looking at the color of person's skin necessarily as the first thing you look at, it's what are you fighting for? What do you need? You need to not have the police, you know, knocking down, knocking at your door in the middle of the night and shooting you, obviously. You need to uh, have good schools for your kids. You need to have a place to live. 
all of us need that. And through the experience of fighting for what we need and what we want for the society, I think that um, if we really just do that, then we would, it'll end up happening across racial lines or other, or other types of division, not just race, gender, sexual orientation, uh, gender expression, et cetera. Because as humans, uh, we have a lot of similar needs, even though some of us may have a little bit more than others, we do have the same needs. That's my thought about it. I think that's a really good question. And I think I would say um, belonging and that abolition cultivates belonging um, and that belonging and creating care is the antidote to division and violence. So that's where I situate myself. You know, I think what's coming up for me is how on an individual level and how we engage with each other. Um, the idea that this way, the way the oppressive systems function is for us to be divided. And so when you're engaging with one another and I'm thinking what's coming to mind, I'll just be frank, it's just all of the infighting that tends to happen when we're all tired <laughs> and um, exhausted and, and feeling unheard. Um, shifting how you engage with each other in order to build together by imagining what the future that you really want to see. Right? Does the future you want to see involve stripping people's autonomy away, stripping their voices out, out of the way, or does it involve a much more engaged, thoughtful process with each other? Um, I think those are some of the ways that you can bring an abolitionist framework into building together so that we can't be separated in a way that helps to, to strengthen the, the systems we're fighting against. Hmm. Um, I'm going to bring up Anthony Jackson. They have a question for Tiffany. Oh, you want me to ask it or is, I mean, it was in the chat. I'm yeah, sorry. No, yeah, I'm sorry. I just, well, we want to invite you up if you'd like to, but I totally can if you want. Oh, you're muted. Oh, wait. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, please excuse me looking crazy. Like I, I've been great. laying down, re listening to this whole thing. Everything has been so good. No, I was just thinking about um, for Tiffany in particular, like when you think about these institutionalized like power structures and how they deny access and how they're, uh, they kind of like reproduce this ideology by, by, by way of like our day-to-day -day interactions and just this corporatized like process, like, when you think about the work that you do, um, the ideology that you have, um, how it goes against like these systems and structures, like what then becomes obstacles that that you run into, um, particularly in thinking about this white supremacist power structure, and then how like what are examples of how you're able to overcome them? Thank you, and I appreciate you. Uh, you do not look a mess. Um, I'm going to drop a link into an article that I just had published because it talks about this. In fact, it was one of the most cathartic pieces to write because I've been mad about how the uh, legal profession works since I entered into it. Um, <clears throat> and there's two, there's kind of two ways that I see it manifest and in which ways that I've learned to navigate it. Um, one on a very personal level. So I enter a lot of spaces where I'm the only black person anybody has interacted with all day, um, uh, perhaps also the only woman. And so even if I'm coming in with uh, the most research, coming in with a better understanding of how the systems interact with one another, I'm the one that's gonna be questioned and where the resources don't go to me, um, they get invested in, in other things. And so it's been really about investing in spaces where, where leadership, be it myself or a partner, whatever, uh, give me the autonomy that I need to be able to do the work that I'm here to do. So really trying to like get out people out of my way. <laughs> you know, there's this case that I'm working on right now that I'm really very passionate about. And I had to turn down the help of seven different attorneys who weren't wanting to participate because what I understood was going to happen is that I was going to be wasting, that sounds rude, 
I was going to be expending resources and to fighting with them about the appropriate way to move forward instead of putting my resources, time, effort, and energy into actually building the case and supporting the movement. And that was gonna be a way of distracting what I'm doing. Um, and that's another way that uh, I think white supremacy interests the work is like distracting you, making you fight just to have your voice um, be, be, be heard or centered in a space when, when the fight is actually greater than you specifically. Um, the other way that I see um, it happening is how cases are actually litigated. And that's really the focus of the article I just posted, which is that lawyers are trained to be not abrasive to the system, right? Um, the system respects lawyers because the system needs lawyers to say like everything is legitimate and it's legitimate because we have laws, right? Instead of the laws themselves being illegitimate, the system itself being illegitimate. And so being able to really, you know, and I'll, <laughs> this might be the third time I say it, like using that creative process to be able to recognize the limitations of the law, but also to use it because we understand that people think that they're legitimate and therefore how can we, you know, turn what they're saying on its head by using its own system, right? So that's, that's kind of the way in which I, those two things show up in my work. Oh, I'm like, can I, I just want to give you a <laughs> and do better for you as a comrade. Um, I'm going to bring up Adam. Um, they, he, he had a question for, I believe, the whole panel. Yeah, thank you. I'm so uh, grateful to be here with all of y'all. What a rich conversation. My question is about cultural work, uh, culture, and art, and artists. Um, but I, 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 I want to frame it in terms of culture in general, not just limited to art and artists. Um, I wrote in the chat, um, how do each of you, our speakers, see yourselves as participating in creating um, culture, you know, and cultural practices or new cultural practices or rituals or spaces that align with abolitionist futures. Um, and of course, I think about Damon's work a lot. We just heard that incredible poem. Um, and I think, you know, artists like Damon are, are really cultural leaders, but also um, you know, revolutionary lawyers like Tiffany and um, policy workers like Brian. And so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, very interested in what Damon's going to say, but also particularly interested in what folks who are not in the arts primarily are going to say. I'll jump in there based, based off of, of how you frame that. I appreciate the question, Adam. Um, and so just one going to my like expansive notion of culture, right? Like when we hear the word culture, if we were like, this is a, 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 a fraught field, but like if we in anthropology, right? And you heard like the culture of a civilization centuries ago, that's more than just like their rippity raps that rhyme, right? Like that is the, the creative practices and traditions of life. Um, and so before going into like the art space in terms of how we organize spatially and physically, right? Like, I think we have to create a new culture for people to be able to embody these revolutionary values and ideals. Um, and so, you know, that looked like at first showing up to the protest in a way that remixed it from, you know, what had felt very whitewashed and institutional coming out of like, you know, the, like the same chance that like a very well-funded labor organization that's like pro-capitalist could do we had to like change that space, right? It had to sound different, the rhythm had to sound different. And then similarly, when we gather, something like not even calling it a meeting, right? Calling it a gathering where we sit in circle, where food is a part of it, where childcare is an assumption and supposed to be a norm, uh, as opposed to continuing to practice or continuing to create in these institutional ways that destroy us. Um, so that's a, a basic level. Um, I think to the art question, I think obviously we need you know, this project of a radical imagination to have people with imagination and nothing uh, nurtures or facilitates that more than creating images in whatever way that is. So whether that's poetic, whether that's visual, whether that's melodic, whether it's with the body. Um, and so, yes, it's always important to have art in the space, in the action, in the campaign. But I'll end with this one thing that just this week I've been reflecting on, because I've been answering that question for years now, um, is we talk a lot about the way art 
impacts movement and like, you know, there's the banner and then there's the dance and there's all of that. But I think it's actually much more important for us to take the responsibility of how movement shapes art. Um, mm. And so when I hear somebody like a no name who has a global platform or even, you know, out of Chicago also like folks like, you know, Vic Mintz or, or Mick Jenkins or, um, or even on like the, the larger platforms, right? Like um, hip hop in, in media, um, even when it's done commercially or contradictory, movement forces art to be different, which then can engage a different audience. And I feel like we don't always understand that responsibility. Um, and we should be very um, firm and grounded in the fact that our movement is actually going to go beyond our efforts. And that's when we are the most effective. So really our measurement should be when somebody is singing about what we're doing without having actively participated, that is one of those little W's if that question comes back up uh, that we can look for. Mm, thank you. Yeah, I think, I mean, Damon articulated kind of a community, a deep rooted community seed that was planted in me in the way that I experience culture um, and that the muscle necessary um, to imagine a world different than what we exist in today um, couldn't be expressed better um, in any way than through uh, art or, or the mind of an artist or in the ways in which we co-create together. So yeah, it's like that ability to imagine definitely feels really central to whatever we're about to build next in all the different ways. I mean, I don't know if I can answer that question about how I'm creating culture. Um, I mean, I guess just trying to create new ways of bringing people together. I'm just trying to bring as many different types of people. Like whenever I'm in a, uh, doing any type of organizing, I try to make sure there's different levels of all the people that are involved. So faculty, students, community members, staff members. Um, always when we're trying to do an event, we try to incorporate culture as well as politics, as well as uh, education into it. I guess just kind of creating like a quilt or a, a unified community through the work. But um, I'll just throw that out there. But uh, I just think that as many bringing people together who have the same interests, but maybe who don't always come together, the more we kind of do that, the more I think we're going to get to a, a different culture, like we're creating a different culture as we do it. All right, we've got about five or six more minutes um, for questions, then we're going to move on. Um, Arushi, I please tell me I said that right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Oh, you're muted. Oh, my bad. My bad. Okay, so my name is Arushi. My pronoun is Arushi, her. I'm from Sacramento, California. Um, my question was for Damon. Uh, you talked about in your like first speech. Um, about the counter-revolutionary and reactionary state and like contradiction and all that stuff. Um, so I wanted to ask to make progress towards abolition, like whether it's like locally or like on a larger scale, like what are some contradictions and compromises that we might have to make like with the tour or yeah, with the reactionary and revolution or counter-revolutionary state to like get actual change like with like with working with like city boards and stuff is it effective to like work with them um to make the moderate change that we can i appreciate that question which is it's really thoughtful um and i am being like challenged on it like on like a, a, a weekly basis because like my cool person if i was just talking my shit answer is like fuck the nation state and like all of its entities and like we don't collaborate with the colonizers um 
but nothing is absolute and everything is fluid and there, there's, there's real harm happening. Um, so I don't know if this was your question or someone else's, they were asking uh, about city council here. Um, and, and yes, we have, uh, you know, a, it can, can go from somewhere from like seven to 12, a block of, you know, DSA facing, um, if not direct organizers that are in city council too, that I wanna name personally is, is uh, Rosanna Rodriguez and Jeanette Taylor. Um, and so, you know, they, they participate in movements uh, beyond their position in the state um, and particularly Rosanna, like, you know, particularly connecting from like uh, our Puerto Rican uh, legacy and, and liberation work, um, name the state as a, as a site of conflict and harm. And so with that, right, for example, uh, we were able to have an alder person intervene when the county sheriff came for our mass training when the defund campaign started. And just like the impact of having, so, or for example, when I was arrested on the first day of, of, um, of uprising, um, they were denying my lawyer access into the building um, and they were using all these COVID lies to as why they were like detaining me incommunicado. Um, and members of city council showed up and were refused at first had to show their city council badge and like that got folks out right so like those are like small examples um and then on the uh, you know on some bigger examples we've had people exonerated from from release because uh we have a better governor than before even though he's still like a billionaire capitalist uh but his lieutenant governor is somebody who we kind of know from community and we get this end of money bail that folks have been organizing for right so how do we we cannot diminish the real value, we cannot diminish that there are people who would be sleeping in Cook County Jail um, that will not be because of this work. Um, but back to this notion, I'll try to answer it now of like these formal wins can so often be used as a way to repress or counteract us. Um, and, and so it is important to not take it for granted. Um, it is important to, um, to like not be uh, moved by any small victory. Uh, but I do think we can lose opportunity if we say that the, the state is not a valid site of contest. Um, and I think more importantly than the actual big W's, which again, always feel contradictory for me, these little W's of when people see us fight the state, everyone doesn't have access to revolution. Everybody doesn't have access to understanding that there is a, even that word nation state is not in everyone's lexicon. So some people just watch the news. And so to see that, hey, there's somebody fighting against, back against this mayor, that's something I can identify with even if I'm being passive. I think there is important uh, liberatory momentum that can happen in that space. But being honest, it feels really uncomfortable. I would rather just talk to niggas on the block all day. And I really despise some of the code switching and the uh, ways in which even our progressive work validates the structure. Like for, I'll stop here. Like the city of Chicago as city council, even if they gave all $2 billion of the annual police budget to every park and every teacher and every social worker, Chicago is still the land that we are on. And the institution that is the city government of Chicago is a colonial outpost of the nation state that I don't want to affirm, but it's harming my people. And so I think it also has a lot of power and capacity for us to you know, hijack or mar marunage our way into new systems and to, to, to new possibilities. So I hope to answer that very big question, but, but it's, it's a deep one that I struggle with regularly. Is it okay if I jump in really quickly? I just wanted to really encourage folks on this call, especially when thinking about, you know, next steps to really think of abolition as a practical strategy for organizing. And that is um, that reforms can happen that are abolitionist in nature. There are abolitionist reforms and there are tangible necessary wins that we need to not only impact conditions of confinement, um, but to move the needle forward in whatever ways that we can. Someone asked a question earlier and I can't remember the exact context, but it was like, how, how do we get people to see? And the reality is, and this came up in a labor conversation that we were having, um, someone, my colleague, Amber Rose shared this quote from Upton Sinclair that it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on not understanding it. So, you know, when you're talking about closing a prison, there's tens of thousands of people 
who are employed by CDCR somehow rely upon money from the carceral state. And this is not healthy. And if we're in fact intending to liberate people and to close the prison, there has to actually be a pathway for healthy employment for these people that are employed by CDCR. We can't just be like, we're revolutionaries. We Great, we can, and there's a space for that person and I hang out with them and drink and get drunk. Um, and I feel gross every time I have to talk to these people, but understanding that employment is life-saving for people and believing that people don't have to be employed by entities that actively are causing harm, given that we're all living on stolen land, you know, um, that there are strategies for liberation that can happen here today, now, in this moment, tomorrow, that um, can reduce suffering. And if, if we can't achieve full liberation today, then our goal should absolutely be to reduce suffering. And sometimes you have to use the mechanisms available to you in order to do that. No, thanks for that addition. Um, next, I actually want to bring up uh, Adam. Adam is going to give a perform or going to give us a chat about what is Lerna and then give a performance um, to close us out. Adam is a poet, musician, and organizer from Chicago. He is the leader of a reggae fusion band, um, and he is currently the interim board member for the Chicago Union of the Homeless and the writer for the, and a writer for the People's Tribune. Thank you, Mac. Wow. Can we just take a big group breath just to like consciously take a moment to let all of that rich conversation sink in and then imagine bringing it forward with us to the next thing that we're going to do? And one more just because that felt so good. <sighs> Thank you. I can't say thank you enough to the organizers, to the speakers, for the everyone for taking their time. This is where I needed to be today. Um, I guess I'm uh, being asked to do the league pitch first and then the song second, which feels right. So um, I'll make this real quick. Um, it's really been a pleasure and an honor, as I said. And um, I'm going to just say a little bit about who we are, the League of Revolutionaries for a New America. As the name says, we are revolutionaries. And our job is to um, figure out what that means in practice and in theory. Um, and we stand on the shoulders of giants and inherit um, a, a lot of important history that I'm very proud of. Um, but essentially, we are members of the working class. Um, we come from all over, uh, all, all kinds of backgrounds. And um, we are class conscious individuals, as well as socially and politically conscious individuals working to elevate the uh, consciousness of our class relatives and to influence the, the struggle and movement that is all around us, which we see as a revolution, a real revolution that is happening right now uh, for world transformation, uh, for, for uh, the change and transition to a cooperative society that must be based on the public ownership of the necessities of life and the distribution of those necessities according to need. Uh, and I like to think of it as uh, studying while we fight and that we're basically a bunch of uh, abolitionists, liberationists, revolutionary nerds who um, are in the tradition of the original abolitionist movements and grounded in a sense of where we are and who we are in history. So we use study and analysis as our tools and our mission is to connect with and unite the scattered freedom fighters and revolutionaries around the demands of this growing new abolitionist class of workers that are demanding food, housing, education, health care, freedom, justice, etc. Um, and we know that this, our class cannot survive under this system of corporate uh, racial capitalism and private property and endless oppression and war that we live under. So um, we use education and events like this and, and organizing like this as a weapon to mobilize, engage in the battle of ideas 
as well as the battles over real resources. We struggle in real time in the streets, in workplaces, wherever we are. We have a newspaper, The Rally Comrades. You can check it out at rallycomrades.org, uh, subscribe, etc. Um, and if you want to join the league, you can. Uh, it, all it means is to accept the program, which is to unite around this fight for basic needs, study and learn from one another, and realize a vision to secure the future of humanity and our planet. You can check us out at lerna.org, that's L-R-N-A dot org, or the uh, various Facebook pages. I believe this uh, event was broadcast in a number of them, including the Chicago one. Um, you can let us know if it was in on the Oakland one, too. Um, some folks can put that information in the chat. Again, thank you, everyone, for coming today. We love and appreciate you. And the future is up to us. All right, so... How was that? <laughs> um, with that, I'll, I'll give us the song. Um, and I'll oh, post Adam. The yeah? Sorry, can you announce the upcoming league events that we have? Yes, yes. Sorry. Right, right, right. That was, that was supposed to be now Sorry. as well. Thank you. No, you're good. You're good. So, yeah, today was just the first out of three dialogues in a series connecting abolition of police and the carceral state to abolition of private property and the construction of a new society or reconstruction of society. Um, June 5th will be the next one with special guest, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this, Candice Mallet, uh, amazing freelance political writer and author of the column Black Canary and more. Please save the date for that uh, discussion, June 5th. July 17th, the third abolition discussion, we are honored to have Ruthie Wilson Gilmore, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, abolitionist scholar and organizer and one of the co-founders of Critical Resistance. That's July 17th. Again, learna.org, where you can get these announcements and more. Um, there's also um, a couple other upcoming events, including a week from today, same time, one to three, and uh, with poetry against fascism. It's called Red Carnation. I'll be part of the efforts here in Chicago, and um, I know there are some folks on the call who will be participating in that. Um, and it's part of an international thing with the World Poetry Movement and the Revolutionary Poets Brigades. Um, yeah, that's uh, very exciting. Please, if anyone has links to any of this stuff, put it in the chat. And then uh, May 2nd, Public Education, What Should It Be Now? Featuring teachers and public education fighters, including the president of the Puerto Rico Teachers Union, who is an amazing freedom fighter, um, as well as a West Virginia teacher organizer of the Red State Revolt, a teacher and public education defender from United Teachers of Los Angeles, and a newly elected community aligned school board member from Oakland, California. Boom. Did I do good? All right. <laughs> Here we go. All right, all right. We're gonna close out with Ella's song, y'all, or at least I'm, I'm closing out uh, my part with Ella's song. This is a beloved uh, song in the freedom tradition. Lyrics and music by Bernice Johnson Reagan, but based on quotes from the great civil rights leader, Ella Baker. It's not letting me uh, paste the entire song into the chat, so I'm gonna do it in two parts. Boom and boom rather than share screen i'd like to allow us to look at each other or you can look at me if you want and there it is but the the lyrics are in the chat please do sing along especially on the chorus which uh happens in between all the verses as choruses do and sounds like we who believe in freedom cannot rest We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes again. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Until the killing of black Man, black mother's son is as important as the killing of white man, white mother's sons. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. That which touches me, that which touches me most is that I had the chance to work with people, passing on to others that which was passed 
on to me and we who believe in freedom cannot rest we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes to me to me young people come first they come first they have the courage where we fail and if I can just shine a light on as they carry us through the gale. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until they come. The older I get, the older I get, the better I know that the secret of my going on is when the reins are in the hands of the young who dare to run against the storm. And we who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Not needing to clutch, not needing to clutch for power, not needing the light just to shine on me. I need to be just one in a number as we stand against tyranny. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Struggling myself, struggling myself don't mean a whole lot. I have come to realize that teaching others to stand up and fight is the only way my struggle survives. And we who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes one more time. Now we who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Amen. I heard y'all harmonizing. <laughs> Thank you.